Hello, and welcome back to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, I'm delighted to have as my guest, Andy Culligan. He is the Chief Marketing Officer for a company called Lead Feeder, based in Vienna, and also a member of the Revenue Collective. Andy, welcome. Thanks for having me, Marcus. Happy to be here. My pleasure. Today, we're going to be talking about this concept of alignment. But before we do, could you give 60 seconds on your background, please? Sure thing. So as you mentioned, I'm uh, based in Vienna, Austria. I'm clearly not Austrian with this accent. I grew up in Dublin. <laughs> but uh, so, so yeah, I, I moved out here 12 years ago and uh, much to my detriment, I've had to be learning German and whatnot. But uh, yeah, so based out here, I've been, I've been working in tech now for about well, seven, eight years. But prior to that, I started my career in, in sales. So I, I started as an SDR. So understand the the toughest role on the planet is what I call it, because I think being an SDR, nobody respects you. You're very young. You're very green. You don't understand the space you're operating in and you're trying to be a salesperson, right? And it's I, I still believe that although all of those things are working against you, you're still the lifeblood of an organization because you're, you're driving pipeline. So I started there at SDR, went into account management, and then following that then went into, into marketing. At heart, I am a marketer anyway. I studied marketing. But uh, following university, I wanted money, so that's why I went into the sales sales route. <laughs> so I, yeah, so I think from my my perspective, I I see things um, a little bit differently to to other marketers that may not have come up the same route as me. Like I understand that the, the plight of the salesperson a little bit better than a lot of other marketers because I've been in that position. So with that, I've managed SDR teams under the marketing under the marketing umbrella, and my main focus before. Be- Come in leadership in marketing or become, before running the entire marketing org has really been a lead generation and demand generation. And again, my sales background to help with lead gen, right? And then following that, going into the marketing leadership space uh, within tech companies. So that's me over the past. Excellent. I see from your LinkedIn profile that you worked with Arthur Price. One of our wedding presents was a canteen of Arthur Price cutlery. So <laughs> very, very happy with them. Good job. Yeah, man. I've done the most random of jobs. Selling canteens of cutlery was probably one of them. And I managed to even sell a canteen of cutlery to the president of Ireland at one point, which was a, a great honor. <laughs> <laughs> um, although I have to say, Arthur Price did have a large ego because he wrote a book about his history, which was excruciating to, uh, to look at. I, of course, had a copy of that book. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, common ground. Okay, so m- moving on. So we're, we're talking about this subject of alignment. What is and what isn't alignment? From my perspective, right, I focus corely or mainly on sales and marketing alignment. Okay. Yeah. So to put it very simply, sales and marketing alignment would be singing off the same hymn sheet. And I think that also goes for alignment across the organization. So it's everybody understanding what each other's roles are everybody having having similar objectives and KPIs and all of those KPIs matching one another and helping one another, right? Um, so one of the things as well, I, I think from a, from a sales and marketing alignment piece is that the first and foremost, both teams should be focused on the bottom line, which is revenue. And a lot of marketing teams are not, okay? So I challenge you there, should it be revenue or profit? So, <laughs> so I would call it efficient revenue. So profit, yeah. So profit, yeah. Let's 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 call it profit. But I it, look, it depends on the the size or the the growth rate of the organization, where you are in your in your in your lifetime as an organization. Yes, of course, everybody should be striving towards profitable growth. Okay, so we. Uh, so where, I, where I'm currently based at Peter, we focus on efficiency and profitable growth. Um, I have worked at other organizations that have focused on growth at all costs, which actually, now that you mention it, actually is detrimental towards alignment. And that's where I was headed. My next question is going to be around what causes misalignment. And you've touched on one thing there, which is uh, growth at all costs. Because I think what tends to happen at that point is you take your eye off the real prize, which is winning delighted lifetime customers. And if you're just going for growth at all costs, the tendency then is to take anybody who may not be in your ICP and your ideal customer profile, 
and you buy problems down the line. I'm speaking to a number of companies, and one of the things that amazes me is their willingness to compromise on terms, to offer discounts that they continue to pay the price for for years to come. And that comes straight off their bottom line and their top line. Then they have to work twice as hard. So you end up with burnout and all that other rubbish that's completely avoidable. And I think that that doesn't just cause misalignment between marketing and sales. That causes misalignment across the entire organization. Because you then have CS teams that are pissed because you're handing over shitty business to them that they can't manage. Yep. So CS being customer success. Then you also have probably from a from a C-suite board perspective, like CEOs coming down heavy on sales. Sales then coming down heavy on marketing because marketing are the ones that are sourcing the stuff. The CEO is telling the marketer you need to grow more. So the marketer is like, oh shit, I need to, I need to grow more. So I'm just gonna go bring everything Absolutely. else in. And then it's just this like. It's just this devil circle, really, that just yeah. doesn't end. It's it's a downward spiral. And exactly. often, it's driv- in my experience, it's driven by ignorance. They don't know any better because that's the background that they came from. And they were fortunate enough to be in um, a, a unicorn. And they think, all oh, this will work. But the reality is 70 to 80% of companies that operate like that fail. Now, often they're being driven by investors or founders or boards that are focused on the short term, and they're not trying to build a business that has happy lifetime customers, where they create a culture of highly engaged employees who give massive discretionary effort. I interviewed a fascinating lady uh, yesterday, a lady called Caroline Peanut, and uh, she works for Splunk. And um, she got cancer while she was on her induction training. And she spent the last year in chemo. Now, what's really fascinating about her is with about two hours work a day, she is now over 300% of quota, and she still has two months left. And the theme that came through all the way throughout that conversation was all about alignment. It was about making sure that she was the conductor of the orchestra, making sure the right people were having the right conversations in the right way, at the right time, with the right people, and there was always forward motion. And unblocking the internal obstacles, making sure that she was communicating to everybody. So let, what, what is it that in your experience? What are the triggers and the catalysts for misalignment? People don't talk to one another. Simple yeah. as that. Like, there's a, <laughs> like people, it's, it's so funny. People say to me all the time, oh, you talk all about alignment. That's well and good. How do you actually do it? Like I put up a thing on, on LinkedIn yesterday saying that marketing opens doors and sales closes them, right? So like it's basically the team being that both teams need to work together in order to close business, right? And somebody wrote to me and said, oh, that's a very big statement, but how are you actually managing to do that? You know, alignment. I'm like, so one of the things I ask whenever I start in a marketing team, it's okay. When was the last time you had your one-on-one with somebody on a sales team? Like, so what, what day of the week do you have it on? They're like a one-on-one. <laughs> last, time, last time I spoke to somebody from the sales team was at the last team event that we did, like, I don't know, six months ago. I'm like, well, obviously that needs to change. So they're not even talking to another, you know? How are you supposed to be aligned with somebody that you have no idea what's happening on their side of the world? No idea. Again, I saw a wonderful quote from Jay Abraham a couple of weeks ago, which is that, in future, your success will be determined by your ability to collaborate. And if sales, marketing, customer success, account management, engineers, consultants, finance, operations, legal, and management are not communicating regularly, then what you end up with is politics. Ambiguity at the top leads to politics at the bottom. And I think one of the big problems that I see is ambiguous communication from leadership. Mm -hmm. And it happens in the board meeting. That then trickles down to the executive level, then into management, and then the people on the coalface do what they can or what they think they need to do, and then they get it in the neck when they fail to meet an unclear expectation. So they get defensive, and they start making excuses and blaming. And it's incredibly inefficient. Why would anybody choose to have a business that is that badly run? It's not that 
difficult to solve. It's it's getting over your personal grievances and personal shite or having those difficult conversations. Seriously, it's, it's sometimes a difficult conversation needs to be had. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. And just calling people out like I've, and it's it's a classic at, at, between the sales and marketing org as well, because, you know, there'd be a lot of, a lot of stuff flung over from one side to the other, right? They're saying, oh, the, the leads are terrible or, you know, and they're hearing that from the bottom up and that's going back to marketing and marketing then get fragile about it. And they're giving out about sales because they're not following up with the leads. And that's, a, that's where it starts, right? So from my perspective, there's always been, and something that's worked really well for me is an educational piece. So when I go and speak with sales, like they don't understand fully what's happening in the world of marketing or don't fully understand what marketing is, right? Everybody thinks they're a marketer generally, right? And everybody thinks they know, oh, you just need to do this. Like I've had a CEO tell me before, like, oh, you know what marketing needs to do? You guys need to go bake a load of cookies, put them in a box and send them to all of our customers. And that's going to make them really happy with us. And I said, I'm not doing that. Like there is no, there is literally no ounce of blood inside my body that want that saying this is a good idea i said this is a terrible idea whereas other marketers would have said oh yeah let me go away and do that and that would cause you know it's not going to work i had the uncomfortable conversation so you want to say something there well, yeah I, 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 there are two stories that are worth recounting at this point i remember i um, was helping a client recruit a marketing director and he was the dog's bollocks i mean he was really very good at direct response marketing and we were talking about how important it was to test. And the CFO, and these, I, I'm quoting him directly. Idea of testing is a really good idea, but can you not run the tests that fail? Because they're expensive. <laughs> I mean, how fucking stupid. So that was one. And then another company that I remember speaking to uh, was giving away brand new iPads for people who took a meeting. So people were just taking meetings for iPads. Because the, and all the the SDRs we were doing was what they were told, which is book a meeting and bribe them with an iPad. Oh, Jesus Christ, that's destined for failure. That's bribery, yeah. bribery. Yeah, but it, <laughs> the, the, the idiocy. I'm paraphrasing Mark Twain here. When you realise the whole world is mad, everything makes sense. My pal Martin Lucas always uh, says that humans don't understand other humans. But if you don't communicate, how the hell are you going to? So to build on your point, what sort of cadence should there be in terms of regular interaction between sales and marketing and customer success and operations so that they right. consistently and regularly? Let me tell you about my cadence, right, Please. and what works for me, right? So at Lead Feeder, we have a CRO, Yako. Myself and Yako talk every single day. First thing in the morning, we chat, how's it going? Right, that, that's how it starts. We build a rapport, we build a relationship. So that's that's important to both of us to build that relationship, okay? And then we start to dig into the numbers. Every single day, what are we looking at from a pipeline perspective? What can we do to drive more? And and what, what are we missing right now? And that's how we start our day five days a week, maybe six or seven days a week sometimes, it depends on how things are going. But And then throughout the day, we see sales come in, I ping them, oh, great stuff. You know, just a... A, a nice little pat in the back. Well done. This is this is this is going in the right direction. Or if we see if see, if he sees something that's not looking right from the marketing perspective, he'll ping me immediately and say, "Hey, this doesn't look right." And there's this constant back and forth between myself and Yako all day long, all day long. And then even in between, even in times, I'm text. We change our channel. We go to WhatsApp or we go to Facebook, and we're texting each other back and forth about work stuff, but also about other whatever, send each other memes, whatever it might be in between just to keep it somewhat light. But there's a cadence there in terms of every single day, constant contact with my counterpart from the sales team, right? And everybody below me sees that. And what we started to do is we, we started to record videos together and talking about, okay, what have we got coming up this week? What are we chatting about? What's in the pipeline for this week? What's cool is coming from marketing? And five-minute video, we post that out to the entire company once a week. Excellent. So that's at the C-level. What about yeah. at the management level and the operational level? So on the management level, what I've started to get to my guys to do, and actually not just started, I did this a year ago, was to speak with the sales leadership once a month. So also same as what myself and Yako are doing. So your counterpart at the sales org, go and speak to them at least once a week, twice a week, daily if you can, and understand what are the grievances on their side and how can you help solve those grievances. 
because I think generally marketers can be a bit precious about being servants to sales. But at the end of the day, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to make selling easier, right? That's the part. A marketing attract and then sales go and just make it, make it close it, right? So <clears throat> you can't do that without having some sort of server relationship between marketing and sales. And it's, it is just that way. And it's really important to understand the difference between service and serve. You have equal stature. You are both contributing to the desired outcome, which is why they, uh, the company has hired you. No one hires you because they want a salesperson, and no one hires you because they want a marketer. Uh, they hire you because they want to generate sales, and they want the customers to be the right kind of customers, and they want the customers to stay with you and be delighted. Because if, you, if you're hiring for any other reason, then you've got it wrong. You're not putting a warm body on a seat because that's just a cost. And without that regular communication, everything turns to shit. In my experience, where you get sales and marketing and customer success and operations meeting regularly, people sitting in on the sales meeting from other departments so they can see what sales is doing, but they can also feed back about how the work that sales is doing is directly impacting the other departments. In a hotel client I had a couple of years back, getting housekeeping and uh, the catering and uh, food and beverage people in, the front desk, the back office into those sales meetings meant that there was clearer communication. And the people who benefited most were the customers. There you now, go. T tell me this. Can you give me some examples of what great looks like? in terms of properly aligned sales and marketing operations? Sure. So I think it's um, there's one part in this that we haven't really covered is that the salespeople understand what's coming at them from a marketing perspective. And that's an education piece, right? And I'll give you an example of what I mean. So typically one of the core grievances from sales to marketing teams tends to be the leads you're giving us are shit, right? Yeah. And Typically, marketers generally, right, this is a generalization, but a lot of marketers are really bad at lead gen, like really bad. They don't have it as a core focus. They don't connect the dots back from what I'm doing to generating leads for the sales team to generating new revenue for the business. It's very, it's a niche that's growing, let's say, okay? Now, the issue is the reason why sales are doing that or saying that if they are getting good volumes of leads coming in, the reasons that they're saying the leads are shit is because they've got no clue what industry benchmarks are. And they've got no clue what industry benchmarks are because you don't have a marketer that has, a, has an idea themselves. It stems down from the top when a CEO or somebody, when they're, when they're hiring marketing, it's again, it's like an afterthought. Like we spoke about, when we'll get to this in a minute, about customer success being somewhat of an afterthought in, in hyper growth organizations. Yeah. Marketing tends to be an afterthought being like, oh, we need to put somebody in there that's going to manage all of the, like we've got a business run coming up, we need somebody to do the t-shirts, right? So like if you've got a marketer in there and you've, you've invested in good marketing and a good marketer that knows what they're talking about, they can go educate the sales team, right? And whenever I hear that excuse from sales, because it really is an excuse, it's like, oh, I don't follow up the leads because they're shit. I was like, okay, well, tell me how many, what's your percentage of shit that you're getting in? So let's start at 100%. Out of 100%, what's the level of shit? Oh, it's probably 30 or 40% shit. And I said, that's wonderful because I am targeting to have 60 to 70% shit, right? So yeah. like you're looking at probably 60% of the leads I'm going to bring in are Mickey Mouse at DonaldDuck.com and 40% are stuff that you're going to be able to sell to. And they go, ha, all right. And every sales team that I've done that with, there's like an instant like light bulb moment to them being like, oh, actually, maybe this isn't as bad as I thought because human beings as a whole, we're always going to focus on what the negatives are, what the bad stuff is. And it's going to be, it's going to become our entire focus rather than boxing that off by just having that knowledge and knowing, Hey, I know that 60% is probably going to be shitty, but 40% of stuff that you can sell to and having that knowledge and transferring that knowledge across has automatically created a road to alignment between marketing and sales. Okay. If 60% is going to be shit, then let me ask you this. If we were to ask better questions about who our customer is and who they are not, and we're able to then focus our messaging more clearly to attract the ideal customer and uh, to self-disqualify 
the non-prospect or the non-ICP, then the impact on sales is that they spend their time as productively as possible. Because we don't, I had a client last year who was getting 600 free downloads of their software every month. And they converted roughly half a percent. <laughs> Got now, it. That meant that 1,199 wasted attempts. And it's not uncommon in hypergrowth tech companies that they are around the 6% conversion rate. Uh, I mean, this was particularly bad, but you know, even 6% seems incredibly wasteful. So why is it that we don't spend more time in planning, in preparation, in challenging ourselves and getting ruthless in our disqualification process at the marketing stage so that when we put the leads into the funnel at the top, then sales is hot to trot because they know, they know that there is an opportunity there. I think it's because most companies aren't doing an account-based approach, which is aligned between the sales and marketing works. I think it's, there's still too much pay and spray stuff. And you're, you're a big advocate of, of saying how, how bad of an approach that is. So that 60% approach, by the way, is, is the old school approach to lead generation. Yep. Now, if you're to turn that in its head and implement an account-based appro uh, approach or focus, then you're going to be flipping that to probably 60% quality, 40% stuff that maybe you won't be able to sell to because it's not the right persona, for example, right? But the volumes are going to be much lower and you're going to also need the entire organization to be aligned. So if you, if you want to be doing an account-based marketing, account-based sales approach, you need everybody on the same page. Like, so you need CEO on the and same page as CMO. Absolutely. And this, this, I think, is the critical point because so many people have come from a traditional direct sales or direct marketing background, and they think that throwing shit at the wall, some of it will stick. In all honesty, I don't think there's an excuse for that nowadays. There are companies like Gap in the Matrix and White Rabbit Intel that allow us to really pinpoint precisely who it is that we should be speaking to, with which messages. There's a pal of mine over in Australia, John Bedwani, who runs the database company. And they're brought in by their clients to start softening prospects up two years before they intend to sell to them. So it's an account-based marketing strategy where they are developing the relationships, they're understanding their strategy, they're getting ahead of where um, sales needs to be. So when they do finally engage, they're dealing with prospects who are already familiar with the kind of problems that you help to fix. And there's two years worth of uh, relationship building already in place. Speaking to Jill Robbins and to Tom Williams, both of those are amazingly strong advocates of partnering and aligning yourself with procurement. They're historically seen as the enemy, but I, I realize that I'm wrong. If you can become their partner um, and you can help procurement solve critical business problems, you make them the hero. They're not going to stiff you on fees. They'll pay your full fees if you can help replace five other products and you can solve a, a number of different departments' issues. It just strikes me that too many people are in too much of a hurry and they don't spend enough time in reflection and they don't spend enough time in constructive conflict. So if you were advising a board, what advice would you give them about revisiting? And COVID, I think, represents a perfect opportunity for them to do this. Take a blank sheet of paper and redesign your marketing and sales operations from scratch. Yeah. If you were advising someone who's going to do that, what choice bits of advice would you give them? So uh, I think you need to start off with the, like, wh who, is, who is our ideal customer? So the ideal customer profile is, is something that people think that they've nailed, but they haven't really, and it should be something that, that is living, right? I think, especially during the COVID times, as you just mentioned at the moment, people's ideal customer profile has changed. So like specific industry spaces, subsets of industries have gone out of business completely or don't have the money to spend. So why would you keep yeah. focusing on them? And then as well as that, like you need to look at like, and it's something you've mentioned already, like are we selling to the right people? Like do we have the right customers right now? What's, what's, our, what's our retention rate looking like? 
Like, what's our net retention looking like? Are we less than 100% net retention? Then we're probably doing something wrong somewhere. So the question is either on the CS side, on the customer success side, or is it actually that we're attracting the wrong types of business? So like really have a good think about that and set that in stone as, as a board, as a leadership team. But I'd be, I'd be tasking the leadership team with that from the board level. And then um, appro- approaching it from like, once you have the ICP sorted, you need to understand like, what's the size of this industry or this, this particular ICP that we can sell to? What's our total addressable market? which I've asked a number of companies this, like how many accounts can you sell to? So like you're focused on the, you're focused on the UK market. All right, how many companies in the UK need your specific service or product? And they're like, oh, we think it's like between 500 to 1,000. So you think it's between 500, so it's either 500 or 1,000. What one is it? Because 500 is 500 and 1,000 is double 500. So you're either saying that your market is either half the size or double the size. So what is it? And they're like, oh, well, we actually haven't dug into that. I was like, and they're like, how do we do that? Well, what you need to do is a lot of shit manual work figuring out your account yes. list. And it's it's heavy lifting and it takes time. We don't have time. Well, do you have time to just go blow a load of cash and just bring in whatever? Is that is, is that what you have time to do? And then they start thinking, okay, maybe not. No. Okay, let's go build out our, our account list, our, our total addressable market list. And then based off the back of that, you can then say whether or not the growth targets for that specific, for the company are actually going to fit what you have as a total addressable market. And if they don't, then you've got to have an, either a very interesting conversation with the board or your investors, or you need to look to extend out your ICP and grow out your total, a total addressable market larger. And essentially what happens then is what you should be doing with that total addressable market is once you have it fixed, here you go, sales and marketing. You guys come up with a plan together in terms of how you're going to penetrate the, these accounts. But here's your accounts. Don't look beyond those accounts. Look at those accounts. Figure out a plan in terms of how to break down doors and those. And that's where you start. And that's where you start to see your funnel being flipped from traditional lead generation, which I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, where you'd be probably getting in 60% of Mickey Mouse at DonaldDuck.com, right? And 40% gold to 60% of stuff or to, to, to personas on accounts that you'd be able to sell to. Probably 40% of those will either be stuff that's just landed on your website, which you haven't been. Uh, like aggressively targeting or personas on those accounts that aren't particularly interesting. It, it's really interesting because I don't think that salespeople or marketers uh, spend enough time challenging themselves with the right questions. One of the partners that I work with was asked by a client of theirs to help them get to speak to more decision makers. And this was a roofing business. And They ran their AI analytics, and what they discovered was that for this particular roofing business, if they went for uh, for buildings that were built between 1970 and 1990, and they were built out of concrete and steel with a flat roof, and they were on a north-south road with an east-facing front aspect, they had a 40% increase in sales the following quarter. Now... The problem is that most people don't know how to ask those questions and they don't know how to do that research. Now, if you can get that specific and you can nail who your ideal customer profile is, and I I have an issue with personas because if Jim is a 32-year-old gamer who likes to go hiking in the hills and goes on backpacking holidays and has two uh, Cocker Spaniels, Okay, that's fine if you're Jim, but it doesn't really cut it when it comes to who your customer really is. And I think um, one of the problems here, and you've touched on it, is down to communication. But why is it almost no marketeers actually speak to customers? I mean, what the hell is going on there? Because they're not in a customer-facing role, typically. They They sit behind I know. I agree with you. I, I fully agree with you. I, I don't, I think I think it's bad that they don't. I think a lot of marketers are arrogant and they think that they know better than the customer or better than the prospect in terms of what the prospect's needs or problems are. And it's easy to say that because you've got this great technology that solves all the world's problems. But at the end, so if you don't fully understand what, what it's solving on the on the customer side or what the actual problems on a day-to-day basis within their organization are. And it's always like whenever you have a customer call, 
it's always sort of night and day in terms of what you think the problems that they have are and what their actual problems are. Because you think of sometimes as your customer on sort of a, on a, either you've got two, two, two perceptions. You've got the, you think that they're on the pedestal and they know exactly what they're doing. They know how to use their technology and they know okay. how to use your technology really well. Or you've got the other opinion where you think they're complete idiots and they should just listen to everything that you jam down their throat. Typically, they tend to be, they're not idiots, don't get me wrong. They tend not to be educated well from the company side, from whatever tech or whatever you're selling. They tend not to be that well educated, right? And that's also a problem that marketing needs to solve, but they're not. They're not solving it very well. And then at the same time, the problems that they're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis are quite similar to problems that you probably experience on a day-to-day -day basis yourself. I, I think there is a, there's a lack of a human element of understanding like, okay, people that we're selling to on the customer side are actually humans that go through the same shit that we need to go through, bureaucracy, whatever it might be internally, as everybody else. And you don't think about that. You just think about, I've got this amazing product that I'm promising to solve all these problems. And you're like, well, me and my company, can my product solve all my problems and needs? No, of course it can't. So why would it be able to do that on the customer side? So there's always like these little gaps that you find whenever you go and speak with a customer. Right. You've just sparked about three or four questions at once. So let me get my head together. <laughs> okay. Um, I tell you, it's a good so, thing. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> that, that's a good thing. Um, okay. So to summarize, just because you've made it doesn't mean customers need it. My pal Jerry Lemberg always used to describe entrepreneurs as people who created elegant solutions to problems that don't exist, which is why you end up with shelfware which is why you end up with massively over-engineered product. The best sales leaders that I've interviewed for the Scale-Ups and Hypergrowth podcast in particular, every one of them speaks to their customers on a regular basis. Their marketing team, their R&D team, their engineers. In some cases, they have um, specialists who've come in from the buying side, so they've been customers, and now those people work with the sales team to basically cut through the, uh, the bullshit and uh, tell them, you say that, you're going to lose the deal. And they're, they're involved in uh, pre-mortems, in rehearsals. They bring in externals who are friendly, who are in those roles, and they rehearse with them so that they get a sense of what it's really like to be those customers. So I'm thinking of people like Jim Lergatic, you know, gone from 10 million to 500 million in five years. Tom Shodor, 42 million to uh, 1.2 billion in five years. Massive emphasis on the customer. And this, again, really builds on something that I learned from Bob Mester, who wrote Demand Side Sales. Really fascinating conversation with him. And that was really about making sure that you build your product from the user up. You've got to really create product that is timely, it's relevant, it's contextually appropriate. You look at Microsoft's T-36 program, they pay their partners a small amount for winning the deal. They get paid a bigger amount for full utilization. They get paid a big amount for repeat business and retention. They get paid another amount for extending their reach within the account. And I think this comes down to culture, it comes down to compensation. It comes down to what you measure. And it definitely comes down to communication. And if you're not focused on, if you're not paying attention to all four of those, then you don't achieve sustainable, long lived hyper growth. You know, I look at someone like UiPath, 100,000% revenue growth in seven years, and they're still in control. Why? Because they do all four of those things really well. So let's talk about compensation, because I think most comp plans drive unintended consequences, which are negative. In your experience, how do you reward all the people who contribute to the successful win and successful implementation and retention of customer? It's a can of worms, this one. Right. Yeah. This is. <laughs> Why do you think I threw it over your <laughs> threw it over the wall to you? <laughs> thanks. Thanks very much for that. No, it's uh, my pleasure. <laughs> so it's a very tough question, right? Um, and it boils down to as well, like if you have marketing teams that are purely focused on revenue, you need to give them a piece of the pie as well when it comes to 
when it comes to the success of the business, right? I, I think that's important. One of the, um, let's talk about it in the tech space, right? So we're in most spaces, but I think a lot of the problems can be solved with either share options or equity from the marketing side. Because if you're fueling the growth of the business, you should be recognized as fueling the growth of the business and then getting rewarded by having a stake within the business. I think that having marketing and comp plans, first and foremost, is fine, but it should be some it, it, like it shouldn't be it shouldn't be taking up a, a large percentage of their var- like a, their variable shouldn't be taking up a large percentage percentage of their of their salary. Like it should be a small bit of, just as a bonus, with a core focus on if it's possible within your organization to offer equity or or options, and that generally fuels people to move things in the right direction from a marketing perspective. On the sales and CS side, this is where it gets. Sales is pretty clear cut. You've got your comp plan. Comp plans then differ between sales, let's say account executives versus SDRs. Also a tricky thing because SDRs can be uh, comped, for example, for meetings booked, right? And then you have a misalignment between the SDR and the AE because the SDR might be just booking everything they possibly can. And then the AE is saying, I'm not, this is, this is shit. Like, why are you throwing this over here? Well, I get paid for meetings booked. So one of the things that I've used with SDRs in the past to comp them on, instead of using meetings book as a comp, use it as meetings completed. So the, the salesperson will have to accept the meeting and then actually the SDR will then be responsible for making sure that that person shows the meeting. Well, there, there's a really interesting metric that I read about recently, which is seven out of eight first meetings do not result in a second meeting. So my thinking here is that you comp the SDR on it going to a second qualified meeting. And they get paid a little bit for the first meeting. But when it goes to a second meeting, that's when you comp them properly. Because if they've set it up really well and they've got the right kind of prospect and the salesperson's done their job, and that's the tricky bit, because let's face it, most people who are in sales are not very good. So you've got to train your salespeople to be good salespeople and to disqualify ruthlessly, but to be able to move stuff forward. I mean, think about... When you think about the hidden cost of wasted opportunities, it's just terrifying. I mean, I don't know what it costs per lead for you guys, but let's say it's 300 quid. Now, that's two and a half thousand, uh, 2,100 pounds to get one meeting to a second meeting. Yeah. Now, if you're a three meeting close, uh, you could easily sink 10K just in the, uh, the pursuit and probably even more if it's an enterprise sale and it's a two or four legged, uh, sorry, a four or uh, six legged sales call where you take it along a pre sales person or you do demos and you've got management involved. Before you know it, the cost of pursuit can easily ratchet up to 40K, win or lose. And mm-hmm. uh, if it goes the whole way, you could be into high six, even seven figures. So you've got to be really effective at this stuff. So taking it to the next stage then. The communication between the SDR and the AE. I always think of the uh, the AE or the salesperson as the captain uh, of the ship and everyone else's crew, or they're the conductor and everyone else is uh, you know player in the orchestra. How do you make sure that that relationship is clear, respectful, and effective? Boils well, down to having good AEs. So like a, a, like a clear cut thing for me was always whenever I was managing an SDR team was to see if an AE was spending the time to understand the plight of the SDR and help the SDR, then that's a good AE. That's a closer. That's somebody that understands the SDR role and how, how useful that SDR can be to them. Because salespeople, let's call a spade a spade here. Salespeople want to sell. What gets them out? Good salespeople gets them out of bed in the morning closing deals and money. Money plays a massive role for salespeople. The more they sell, the more money they make, right? Like, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a typical thing. So how can they make more money? They can make, get, make more money by getting more pipeline. How can they get more pipeline? By utilizing their SDR in the best possible way that they can. And it's really down to sales leadership to see or to, first of all, see if, if the salesperson understands what it means to have SDRs on the team. Some salespeople don't even get it. They think, oh, I'll just go off and do it by myself. The SDRs, whatever they're doing there, I'll lead them to it. But if they can really utilize that position, they can get their calendar booked up with meaningful meetings. But they need to steer them in the right direction. I mentioned earlier on the call that the typical SDR profile is about 11 years old that has no experience whatsoever in any industry, right? <laughs> 
and on top of that is in a role that they don't want to be in. Right. So it's probably one of the only roles that like nobody, I've met two SDRs out of hundreds of SDRs that actually wanted to be an SDR. So everybody is like, when am I going to get it? When am I getting my promotion to AE? Right. That's exactly where they're at. Right. I think a good salesperson is able to fuel that motivation to get them, to promise them that they'll help them get them up to that level, almost like a mentor type of position. And then that constant, like it's, it, I've seen it like the best day is sit down with their SDRs or the SDR that's servicing their calendar or whatever it might be, like once a day for a half hour and say, hey, look, what are, what are the objections that you've had to handle today? X, Y, Z. Okay, then you could have gone this way or that way. Try this, right? It's simple. It's again going back down to talking to people, right? And we don't talk right. enough to people. You know, understanding what the problem is and treating like each other like, like humans and saying that we have, we, each of us has problems that need to be solved. How can I go and help you a little bit based on my experience? It's not difficult. It's not rocket science. Uh, and again, when I speak to people like Alexei Mudawa, Gabrielle Blackwell, uh, when I speak to people like Jen Ferguson, when I speak to uh, people like Caroline Pino, every one of them spends that time either speaking to their AE or being an AE speaking to their SDRs. They communicate, they are helping those people grow and develop. And I think this is part of the, it really starts in the recruitment process uh, as well. If you do not create the right kind of expectation that the SDR role is something you're probably going to do for 15 to 18 months, yeah. and this is where you are learning your craft, and these are the specific milestones that you need to be able to achieve in order to qualify for a promotion into an AE role, or you can move into a more senior BDR or SDR role, that's where things go wrong. I think most of these problems start in the recruitment process because then what happens is things like coaching and training get sacrificed uh, in the rush because people don't spend enough time stepping back, reflecting, asking themselves questions how they can get better, then you don't see any progress. And you know you end up reinforcing crappy behaviors, terrible beliefs. And the metaphor that I've come up with now is that you know it's like a battlefield littered with the corpses of burnt out SDRs who yeah. are just frustrated as hell. And they're constantly looking over the fence to see for, you know, is there a better opportunity? And you look at the turnover rates. It's bloody expensive to recruit. It's even more expensive to lose good people. And Phil McGowan, who just uh, completed his PhD in sales at the University of Portsmouth, his research suggests that the business pays the price for 30 months after a salesperson leaves. You've got to stop thinking about the here and now, and you've got to think about the future, and you've got to step back and analyze what works and what doesn't. One of the things that I see the best companies doing is having a failure log. So they allow people to fail. They don't let the business fail, but they punish people for hiding their failures, but they encourage them to share them so that they can constantly improve. And this is where, I guess, those daily huddles with Yako really come in because, you know, we fucked up here. How can we improve it? This is the problem. This is, these are the solutions that I've come up with. Can you make them better? I think that this is actually an interesting point because in, in the tech space, because I've, I've come from a different industry, a slow moving industry into the tech space. And the slow moving industry was like a, a big uh, so multinational organization that the industry itself was basically run by old men. Things didn't move very fast and all. And then I came into the tech space, my head started spinning. But one of the, one of the things that the tech space is very guilty of is not accepting that people make mistakes. And when they do make a mistake, come down with them with a, with a hammer. Right. And, and quick decision making. Oh, let's just fire them and find somebody else. You know, this very, very shooting from the hip approach, which is never good because it, it, it affects the entire organization then for months, as you said. So and one of the areas in the organization that's quickly judged is the SDR organization. Oh, they've been with us 30 days now. They've only booked three meetings. I better fire them and find somebody new. Like I've worked with leadership <laughs> like that before. It's a terrible way of doing things because Two things, onboarding and expectations. I think expectations are incorrect if you think that an SDR is or a junior SDR is going to be successful in the first 30 days. I think you're very, very wrong if you think that's going to be the case. 
maybe even their first 60 days. They will see, see some success if your onboarding is shit hot. Yeah. But the expectations, again, though, in hyper-growth organizations are typically fueled from the very top, fueled then by investors, fueled by, hey, we're, we're, we're after hiring an SDR, an SDR, an extra SDR, because we want to get this amount of sales. I'm not knowing, hey, these things take a little bit of time. We need to have a little bit of patience with it. And then it's quickly, as you mentioned, burn them out, fire them, bring on the next, the next line, right? It's like this first line of defense in the war. Send in, the, send in this first line. Once they go, send in another first line and nobody cares. Whereas if you can, if you can invest the time and effort into lowering the turnover rate in that organization, you will reap the rewards. And what are the rewards? You'll have people that have been growing up within the organization. They're hugely loyal to the organization, understand the product like the back of their hand and understand the blight of the customer because they're day in, day out qualifying. That's what they're doing, picking up the phone, qualifying people. What are your problems? What are your needs? What's the budget look like? What's the, who's the right person in this organization to be speaking about? What's the time on these? And then after a while, they start to get a feeling for what works, right? And what, what's the problem on the customer side? That then then translates when they actually do get the chance to move up into the next role. They're probably given the best possible opportunity to be an excellent salesperson because they already understand the customer, something that you've already said a couple of times. So instead of hiring new sales resource from somewhere else that doesn't fully understand your customer. I think one of the really important things that AEs can do is bring the SDR onto sales meetings every now and again so yeah. that they can see the output and they can experience what's going on and you know, good, bad, and indifferent meetings so that they see what good looks like and they can make that comparison then, and they can listen to what the customer is saying. And then the other piece, which, again, we touched on it earlier about marketing speaking to customers. I think one of the most important functions that a good marketing team will have is developing the customer hero story and going out and speaking to customers and finding out about what it's like to be them, why they originally brought your business into their business and decided to buy from you, what the impact has been what the competitive landscape looked like beforehand, because they will tell you how to sell and attract people just like them. Mm -hmm. you, know, you want to attract more people like your ideal customer. But you know, I, I see this all the time where organizations go out and because they're in this rush for logos and this race to revenue, they're paying homage to the church of finance as well. Then what you end up with is lots of customers who are asking for stuff that actually is a distraction, it's expensive, and they then churn. So you've, you've spent a fortune acquiring these uh, leads and then bringing them on board, and then you blow it because you're trying to satisfy people who you shouldn't be satisfying. One final question in that case, because I, I think what's really underserved in both sales and marketing really effective management and communication in the middle of the funnel. And that's the function of the way sales and marketing and CRM are set up. You know, you've got marketing piling on the leads. You've got uh, the manager pounding the desk and their chest saying, work harder, speak to more people. Whereas the best SDRs and BDRs I know actually speak to a handful of people every day, but they do their research. And they do fantastic quality calls. And so they get three, four, five meetings a week that are absolute gold. And then you put an opportunity into the CRM. And the first question it asks you is um, estimated close date. Now, if you then move into the end of the, the process, you forget the middle of the funnel. And one thing I found really powerful is when I'm engaged in a sales cycle with a prospect and they're now live, then I spend a large amount of my marketing and uh, content production on trying to speak to them whilst they're in the middle of the funnel, talking about their real life issues and delivering value to them in that process. Your thoughts on what the best marketers do in that space? Some of the things that I've been doing here at Lead Feeder and also my previous employer at Exponia was that um, I wanted to alleviate this thing of marketing hands the lead over to sales, our job is done. Right. I wanted to stop that nonsense because our job is not done. On, even past the close, our job is not done. We should always be looking to get more and more and more 
uh, from our customer base. So like you, you get them from prospect all the way down to customer success, right? And you're helping success all the way down to the funnel. But in that mid space between opened opportunity and closed opportunity and looking to maybe speed up that sales cycle, for example, what are you doing? So there's a number of things which you can be doing, which you just mentioned there, creating content which is applicable to them, which, which we do. At the same time, you, you want to be one of the approaches that I always said to my guys was like, let's make sure that our brand is the first thing that they see in the morning and the last thing they see before they go to bed at night. And let's make sure that at least six people from that company are seeing that. So I want you to target this shite out of them, right? Display yeah. advertising, right? Because people are going to, they're going if it's a, if it's a large enterprise deal, typically you're going to have probably six to 10 people that you're going to be talking to on that account from a sales perspective. And if it's a larger investment, it's going to be something that that's going to be known within the organization. So I just said, everybody from the cleaners up should know exactly who we are, or at least know our brand or recognize our brand. And it doesn't need to be expensive to do that either. You can do it with some simple targeting software you can use on, on LinkedIn, for example. And what we would do is we would create, and it was quite simple, we created a Slack channel between ourselves and the, and the sales team, so marketing and sales. And any time that anything ended up in, in, in open opportunity, we would be notified. But then in the Slack channel, it would say, from the salesperson, like the salesperson, like this is awesome for marketing because it helps me close things. They then post in here, here are the list of problems that this specific customer has or prospect has. I want you to target this type of profile and go get them. Like we could also get that from the CRM, but like if you're building something from a marketing perspective that you don't want to spend huge amount of time, money, resource, et cetera, to get moving just to have everything automated, you can do it using the tools that you have. And that's, that's what we did before in the past. And it worked really well in that middle, middle space, as you mentioned. First thing, they see before they, first thing they see before they fall asleep at night and the first thing they see when they wake up in the morning, your brand. That's brilliant. I mean, you've touched on, on something really important, which is coverage. In enterprise sales, you're going to have six to 10 people influencing or making the decision. But most AEs only cover one to two people, which is just pitiful. And this is where marketing can really come into their own. Wow. This has been a fascinating conversation. I'm conscious we've hit the, the top of the hour. So uh, tell me this, what, what are you struggling with? What are you wrestling with at the moment? <laughs> so there's plenty of things to be wrestling with. Like this year has been actually a very good growth year for us at Lead Feeder. So if I look back at March and April times, they, they were our toughest months. We've then seen good growth month on month. I think the thing... That maybe is a, a little bit of a struggle is that things are constantly changing, which is hard for long-term planning. So me as a leader, I'm trying to keep the team focused on long-term goals. And the longest-term goals that I can be looking at is sort of a queue, maybe a half, right? And that's even pushing it, right? That's really pushing it. I know people say, oh, well, that's quite a bit, a half. But even on the queue level, like things can drop or things can change very, very quickly. And it means that I need to adjust everything everything again i'd say that's a slight a bit of a struggle i would say i wouldn't i wouldn't call it a massive struggle i think everybody's in that same boat but it's also like remaining efficient whilst growing as well right so we're very efficient as a business and we also want to go to the next level of growth now i could immediately start hiring start bringing more people on board start executing more but then with that i'm going to be blowing a lot more spend right and then that if that doesn't work, which I know when there's, we said this before, where about a CFO saying, hey, uh, I think testing is great, but only do the tests that work, right? That's, yeah. you know, that, that approach, like you can't have your cake and eat it, right? It, does, it doesn't work that way, okay? Like if you want to be doing massive testing to see massive results, then I'll, like I, you have to be expecting a good chunk of that isn't going to work and you're going to be left with some inefficiencies there, right? So it's, it's about that juggle. How do I invest? right in the right people first of all like i've got a i've i've got a fairly good cadence when it comes to that but then actually the right positions to bring us to the next level and then also making the right investments from a from a paid spend perspective how do i like how, how do i make sure that i'm being as efficient as possible there so there's some efficiency things that are going through my head because currently right now we're being very efficient right we've got like an 11 month payback period on our customers with a with a 12 month payback period target 
So like it's 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 it, our our LTV to our lifetime value to, to customer acquisition cost ratios are really really strong. It's a bit of a balancing act, you know. Again, I think these are issues that a lot of fast growth companies are experiencing. One thing that I've found very helpful with my clients historically has been to always keep an eye on the strategic trends within their customers' market and look 18 to 24 months ahead and have those conversations now with your customers because that will tell you where they are likely to be headed and it gives you at least some forward visibility of where the demand is likely to be and how you need to adjust and the kind of changes that you need to make to product. That might be something worth considering. I think those things that happen. One of the one of the don't want to say call it a struggle, but one of the the challenges from our perspective is that we are we are a um, we're a volume business. So uh, we and we work with a lot of SMBs from yeah. a lot of different industries and a lot of different spaces. And with that, that brings its own challenges. And it's very hard to remain very successful in that SMB space because and we see that with a lot of our competitors being like, ah, oh, we give up. Let's just go towards enterprise. So um, if you look at the red threads that run through your best customers, the ones who shout the most about lead feeder, the ones who recommend you, are there any common threads that run through whichever industry sectors they're in? Yes, there are. We have those. We have those common threads and we're working towards them in terms of product. Right. So there's okay. plenty of exciting stuff to be coming out over the next 12 months. Excellent. Okay. Andy, tell me this. You've got a golden ticket and you can go back and advise your idiot 23-year-old self with one choice bit of advice that you know he would have ignored. What would it be? <laughs> so it's funny you say that 23 years because I, I moved to Austria with not speaking a word of German at 23 years old. And I'll tell you the exact moment I decided to do it. I was lying in bed beside my now wife in Dublin, pissing down rain outside. You said, I can't live here anymore. The weather's killing me. And I said, well, let's just go back to Vienna, Austria then. And she said, okay, well, let's let's do it. And that's how I made the decision that I'm going to up my life and move to a country where I don't speak the language. So uh, <laughs> if I had the golden ticket and go back in time, I there's not a not a huge huge amount I would change in terms of how I approach things. I think I'd probably tell myself that you need to go through those shitty situations. You need to be dragged up. Right. And I've had so many times where I taught in my in my career, oh, this boss is an asshole, or I can't deal with this, or this is giving me terrible anxiety, and so on and so forth. I just tell myself that you need to go through that in order to be successful. Like nobody has that like free ride all the way up to the top. It doesn't work that way. It's the grit that makes the oyster. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's, you know, I think personally and 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 professionally. I'd give myself that advice to both. And everybody goes through a certain level of shit on personal and professional side of things. And that's just life. And you're just going to have to accept it. But it makes for you a better rounded individual at the end of the day. Absolutely. I've never learned anything meaningful or useful from my victories. From a damn good kicking, plenty. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Andy, um, what would you recommend people read, watch, listen to, because you think this is right on the cutting edge or it's massively important that they are influenced by this material? So a couple of things, like, uh, so podcast-wise, I, I listen to Demand Gen Radio. I think uh, it's good for, for marketers that are trying to learn a little bit more around the SDR space um, and also the lead generation space and the best way to be effective. Every marketer where I started understanding the sales piece in tech a lot more, having also been in an SDR role, but understanding it a lot more from a marketing perspective after reading Predictable Revenue by Aaron Ross. It's a little bit outdated now, but these, he does have an updated version of, a, of, a, of his other book, Impossible to Inevitable, which is also a very good read. So Aaron was the guy who, who start, started the, the outbound function at Salesforce. And within four years, they grew the they grew the revenue from 10 million ARR up to over 100 million ARR, and a lot of that was built around that outbound function. So really good read, predictable revenue. And on top of that, like I tend to keep it limited in terms of the amount of business books I read. There's so much, and 
I see like people mention on LinkedIn, like I've read these 20 books this month and you need to read them. All. Like, look, the best, the best learnings that I've gotten is from a handful of books, I would say, but uh, really the best learning that I've gotten is, is from, uh, is from doing testing and doing. And if you, if you fuck it up, as you said, just make sure you fix it pretty quickly afterwards. That's the best advice I can give. And Absolutely. go talk to people. Yeah, Spend the time lesson. talking. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. And talk and to your the, sales counterpart. And have the humility to accept when you fuck up. And use that as a, your best teacher. A couple of books that I would strongly recommend people read. Unlocking the Customer Value Chain. And forgive me for butchering the name. Uh, it's Thales, T-H-A-L-E-S, Teixeira, T-E-I-X-E-I-R-A. And I would also recommend Demand Side Sales by Bob Mester, M-O-E-S-T-A. Really very good. And Tom Williams, uh, Buyer Centered Selling, and uh, his other book, The Seller's Challenge. Both of those really worth a read. Excellent. So, Andy, how can people get hold of you? So, I, I'm very active on LinkedIn. You can grab me on, on LinkedIn, just Andy Culligan. And uh, Marcus, if you, you, I guess you can share with this podcast as well the, the link to my to my LinkedIn profile. But uh, please feel free to yeah. reach out. Just let me know if you want to have a chat about anything or discuss about marketing sales alignment or any anything that's come up on this call at all. I'd be really happy to speak with anybody. Brilliant, Andy Culligan. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marcus. This is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor Podcast. If you found this conversation stimulating, then please get in touch with me at Marcus at laughs, L-A-U-G-H-S hyphen last L-A-S-T dot com or via LinkedIn. And if you know someone who'd be a great guest, then please do get in touch. And don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Take care. Happy selling. Bye-bye.